Well, actually, first, first of all, Jeff, how do you, do you feel the ceremonial first guest on, on the YouTube program? It's uh, it's wild. <laughs> I didn't think I'd make it here. I really didn't. That's what it's... happens when you bribe me with this. With the, with the <laughs> that's problem. exactly it. Yeah. With something that's no light on. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. We are at the end of the 2023-24 European seasons, and what better time to bring on my first guest to the channel than right now with my man Jeff Reuter of The Athletic, an excellent, excellent writer, analyst, tweeter, friend, drinking buddy, whatever you want to say. Jeff is really good at it. So Jeff came on, and we debated our best 11s for Americans abroad in the 2023-24 season. There was a lot of overlap between what will be the Copa America starting 11 or, or starting 11 from, from the pool. We were creative. We did just want to honor the performances from players of this season. Um, I feel pretty good about my team. He, feel pre he feels pretty good about his. It was good to talk and kind of expand on all of this and sneak in a couple transfer nuggets and, and information that I had in there, a couple couple jokes that maybe don't happen in a 10-minute in a YouTube video here of me just talking to myself. It's nice to hear somebody else's perspective rather than my just my own voice talking out loud. So it was excellent to have Jeff. And without further ado, because this is a bit of a long one, we're going to get to it. But first, Dan Soder, take us away. Introduce Jeff Ruder. Jeffrey! For our U.S. national team best 11 abroad in 2023-24 season. Um, and I'm bringing in the man, the legend that is Jeff Ruder, the athletics very own, my good friend, my esteemed colleague, to uh, tell me where I'm wrong in my best eleven for Americans abroad. So Jeff, how do you, how do you feel about your roster and uh, telling me that I'm wrong? I feel really good about telling you you're wrong. I feel less good about my roster. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting because we're starting to see a shift in where the strengths and weaknesses are in the U.S. men's national team player pool over the last, let's say, four or six years. If you think about it, like six years ago, every single article was why can't America develop a left back, right? <laughs> and now suddenly we're at a point where it's like, why can't America develop a goalkeeper anymore? So um, yeah, just really excited to get into this and, and to crash the channel. You haven't had a guest before, which is kind of crazy to me, but you're the star. Yeah, I, I get it. I <laughs> no, it's, maybe we'll go with the psychology, the, the psychiatrist couch here. It'd be like, I don't don't like ass bothering <laughs> other people. Plus, like, just the idea of me trying to tell you a time for this took 48 hours because it just came up. <laughs> yeah, it took uh, us a I, minute. I, tried to play my dad in racquetball the, uh, a couple days ago, and then the Kevin Sullivan mm -hmm. press conference happened. I was like, sorry, dad. And he's like, I get it. Uh, he beat my <laughs> six-year-old father, beat me at it's racquetball. It's not you. It's a 14-year-old. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so again, this is, uh, we, we try to do it to, uh, I'll speak for myself at least, how a team would actually function on the field. That's how I like to do best 11s. Uh, maybe you could poke holes kind of in, in the formation or the, whatever, but like, I think that this could be a realistic team. Um, and so that's kind of how I did it. And I was trying to, not, we're not trying to straight away, but like, this is quite obviously not my starting 11 for Copa America or whatever. This is just <laughs> yeah. the merit of, you know, team of the season for Americans abroad. Yeah, and and I'm I'm with you. I did not pick a Copa America starting lineup, even though I don't think I would have a current MLS player in that lineup. But th this is not that team. Um, it, instead, what it is, you know, I I looked a little bit at the quality of the league, right? Like Jonathan Tompkinson mm -hmm. at uh, League Two, Bradford City. Like he was in and out of the lineup, but like he didn't factor for consideration at center back, right? I'm not going too contrarian with this, but at the same point, uh, <laughs> again. This isn't necessarily, this is the best player at this position. This is the player who's going to start mm. over Gio Reyna, of course, who didn't get selected often enough for Dortmund and Forrest right. to get considered for this sort of thing, but he would be in my starting lineup for the Copa America. So uh, yeah. we're praising some good club seasons, and uh, some of these guys won't even make the the, the the squad for Copa, and that's just fine. We're focusing on yeah. the club. Yeah, and I will say, like, it would have been more fun, I think, like, two years ago. Like, I did this for the Guardian. And like my goalkeeper was Josh Cohen and like my right back was Henry Wingo. And it's like those God. players were nowhere near the pool, but like, yeah. well, and truly, like I thought that they were the best two because I like, think that was oh, yeah. the disastrous Sergio death season or whatever. Right. So that yeah. would be more fun. We just don't have examples of that this year. And it would have been like really going out of my way to try to be like being different just for the sake of it, which is super corny. Right. So um, like the, I think the Dante Pulveda fun. crowd or whatever like that. <laughs> yeah. They're not, they're not getting fed for Aberdeen, unfortunately this time. No. <laughs> All right, enough of uh, enough of a preamble. I'm gonna t I'll just uh, instead of going position by position, maybe we'll just say what our lineups are. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I'll start. It's my channel. Screw you. I went with uh, four two 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 as a uh, you know, hearkening back to the 2009 Bob Bradley days. Cool. And I think that this fits the best 11 players in the in the team. Even though I wish that I could play without a goalkeeper. Uh, Ethan Horvath in goal. Back four of Brian Reynolds, Cameron Carter, Vickers, Chris Richards, Anthony Robinson. A uh, double pivot of Johnny Cardoso and Weston McKinney, uh, two attacking midfielders of of 
Malik Tillman, Christian Pulisic, and strike partnership of Aji Wright and Josh Sargent. Okay, I think over half of our team is similar. I went with a 4-3-3. I also would have loved to abandon a goalkeeper if I could have, <laughs> and we'll get into that shortly. Um, I did keep Matt Turner in as my goalkeeper. Okay. Uh, at right back, I have Serginio Dest. At center back, I have a partnership. Two lefties, John Brooks and Mark McKenzie. Uh, I have Jedi Robinson at left back. I've got Jarni Cardoso and uh, Weston McKenney in the midfield. I've also got Gianluca Busio. And then I've got Ooh. a front three, left to right, Haji Wright, Josh Sargent, Christian Pulisic. Yeah, that's a good shout with with Busio and being able to put Haji right. I, I like I was digging into it when I was looking at the numbers and I was like, oh yeah, like he did spend like a lot of time playing like on the wing rather yeah. because like at first I was like, oh I gotta make it because like he plays center forward obviously for the national team, but he has that versatility. Um and I'm already gonna make a quick um a quick change. Yeah, desk <laughs> over Reynolds. I, I'm, I'm I'm dropping Reynolds. I'm, I'm gonna it's like no. all of my thoughts around desk have been about the torn ACL <laughs> and like and then like not getting the purchase option picked up. But yeah, yeah. He, he definitely did more than Reynolds, so I'm going to change that. I had Reynolds second, to be fair. I did actually write on my list Reynolds ahead of Wea and Scally. So yeah. it was a defensible pick, but fine. <laughs> You're coward. That's cool. No, so, no, no. no. De- Des is definitely the better one. Um, So I'll start with goal. Yeah, The time I want to spend the, the least amount of time on. Ethan Horvath, literally by default for me, like he had a worse goals against per 90 than Matt Turner, but surprisingly his... um. Uh, sh- uh, expected goals on target versus goals against is actually a better per 90 than Matt Turner, which yeah. is the most shocking part of all this. Matt Turner's was like literally bottom of the Premier League or somewhere exact, really close right. to the bottom, which he's like literally the best shot stopper Major League Soccer has ever seen since we've had these advanced stats. So, yeah. and that that is, if anything else, that is a skill that should be repeatable because he had been doing it for the national team as well, if you want to talk about higher quality. But like, that's really disappointing to see from Matt Turner and how it all worked out i thought it was going to be good for him at nottingham forest um again and this isn't a big big vote of confidence for ethan horvath because he didn't have a great season either right. but it wasn't as bad as as turner and gaga Solnina didn't do enough for me either and i don't yeah, even know it, who else you choose behind those guys it's it i i truly pulled up like three different websites to look at american goalkeepers abroad and it's that trio so your choices are a guy who started the first half <laughs> season the premier league and was dropped um for a player who didn't outperform him it should be said but <laughs> Up after it. Um, you've got a young goalkeeper who played for the last place finisher in Belgium who got relegated and was absolutely overworked by a terrible defense at Upen. And then you have a goalkeeper who spent half a year unregistered by his club and then went and had a very mid-tier second division, second half of his season. It's uh, it's bleak. Um, I will say Ethan Horvath, I think, has cemented himself as the second best goalkeeper in the pool for now. Um, I, I would have no issue with him being one of those you know, just before a penalty kick shootout in the quarterfinal uh, at the Copa America substitution things. Um, if Matt Turner is having a little bit of a shaky day, I still think that Ethan Horvath has that sort of, uh, he's he's had those performances for the U.S., yeah. right? Cardiff, it didn't really transi- transition over. He wasn't the same sort of guy that he was with Forrest or with Luton during their promotion seasons. Um, but for me with Matt Turner, uh, his footwork still needs work, right? He's needs to have some of that sort of possession based goalkeeping. Um, but his launch rates were all solid. His, his shot stopping was uh, about what you'd expect from a team that was fighting relegation for most of the season. Um, and I think ultimately it just came down to, I still, I still think that he had a slightly better season overall than Horvath, but I think if Horvath had spent the entirety of the season at Cardiff, it would have been really, really difficult to argue against him as the goalkeeper on this specific team in this specific exercise. I agree, and I'm gonna I'm gonna toss it to you. Which one of the players that I had on my bench do you think that you'd rather put in goal? If you could? Tanner Tessman, Brandon Vasquez, Kim <laughs> Ream, I think those would be one one of those three. And I think that I would lean. I think because Tessman would have the young athleticism and everything else, yeah. but like I kind of feel I kind of feel like Vasquez. I think. I think Vasquez was my guy too, because I think Tessman, it was, it was close with Tessman because he, like you said, he has that, that youthful, but I don't think he's going to read the game the same way. I think I would want either a center back or a striker who's used to playing in the box more than like a box to box midfield guy. Right. So I, I think I'm going Vasquez as well, because if nothing else, he would claim every single cross and just with his broad, broad, like NFL safety shoulders would just absolutely take out anyone else in the air. And you can't teach that. You really no, can't. You can't. So, can't uh, yeah, Brandon Vasquez would be my goalkeeper if uh, if this was a fun exercise. Um, all right, back line for me. Got so yep. guest CCV Richards and and Anthony Robinson. Yep. I'm gonna start with the most like Anthony Robinson 
is so incredibly consistent and like his underlying numbers for among fullbacks in the Premier League, 99th uh, percentile in interception, 71st in tackles, but yeah. then also 74th in expected assists, 84th in um, successful take-ons and 83rd in progressive passes received. That is a modern fullback if you could create one in a lab. And like, oh, it, yeah. it, it's there's not much to talk about because there is no second. Like, it, this was the most obvious pick, <laughs> yeah. probably yeah. next to Pulisic of this entire team. It's those two. But like, yeah. I don't want to just like overlook it because this was an insane season, just in, yeah. incredible for Anthony Robinson. Yeah, I wanted to stress that too. This it wasn't just like good season for <laughs> a U.S. pool left back, right? Like, because again, six eight years ago, that was it. That's all we had. It would be like Eric Lehigh had a pretty solid season for. <laughs> what America has right now in that position. Like this is genuinely like borderline premier league team of the year season yeah. put from yeah. it. Like I, I, I looked at this too. Um, and like when you adjust for every 1000 opponent touches, when we look at fullbacks statistically, we usually try to do a, like a rate base because every team uses their fullbacks so differently, right? Like yeah. Victor Moses for Antonio Conte wing back is going to play such a different role than shot. like Ben white for Arsenal. <laughs> right. So like, you need to do it per 1,000 opponent touches and no fullback, left side, right side, wing back, fullback, you name it, averages more interceptions and block passes per 1,000 opponent touches in the league this year than Jedi Robinson. Phenomenal. Like, that's exactly what you want to see defensively. He's 17th per 100 of his own touches and chances created as well. So he's doing it at volume. It like That's a guy who needs to be playing Champions League next year or Europa League at a minimum. Like, you know, he could do it in any of the big five leagues. He could just like genuinely, I think that this was a this was the sort of year that people have been expecting to see over the duration of an entire season from him. He's shown it for extended stretches, but mm. then had a few off games here and there for Fulham, certainly since that move, but um, tremendous season for him. Interesting. So I, I was going to save this for later, but for me, I would, I think I would slightly lean to him staying at Fulham just because of how consistent and how great it is and that you don't want to be in a position where you're kind of stuck on the bench or whatever that like, if he doesn't get a single bit better than this, I think it's, this is still a phenomenal success. So yeah. like, maybe I'm just being boring or overly cautious in that. Like I kind of don't want to risk this, but no, like, I mean like different points of their career. Right. But the cautionary tale is Serginio Dest and he's going to be on our team anyway. So let's just do that. Right. Like <laughs> yeah, you move yeah. him to a club that's a little bit too big where he's going to be rotated in and out. Right. Spends two years at Barcelona is kind of a squad guy. 20 starts a year gets loaned out to Milan. Doesn't really come off at all. And then PSV finally gets his chance. And that was a level that was a much better side for him. He looked that was the mm -hmm. best season of his career to me. Bar none. First time he's cleared 2000 minutes for a club in a league season yet. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's honestly the cautionary tale here. The, the, the difference, I guess, would have to be the England tax because he does count as a domestic. So, like, for any of the, the clubs from the Premier League, he would be great for registration. So that also makes him more valuable. But, um, yeah, I'm with you. I don't think that there's anything wrong with the fit right now under Marco Silva. But um, And then for Serginio Dest, like, really tough with that injury. But um, hell of a year right before that. Yeah, and look, like... I, I understand that PSV still do want to sign him. And that's been part of the narrative that they've made sure to put out in, in declining his purchase option. I just don't think that's really any way to run a club to save yeah. to what best case scenario you save three or 4 million maybe. Right. Or right. you open right. it up to his contract expires, I believe next summer. So then it, he'll be able to sign a pre-contract before that. And you might not sign him or the contract price might go up when he's, uh, proves that he's back to fitness oh, yeah. and, and back to being able to play. And now it's an open market, a free market. Like, yeah. I just don't particularly understand the value in this, let alone like the morality side. I think that you stick by your guy. You say, yeah, we were going to do it. Let's do it. Like, and, and maybe there's yeah. some goodwill to come on either side of that. But like, I don't even see in a strictly cold business sense. Like, yeah, there's a little bit of upside. You save a little bit of money, but at what opportunity cost, at what cost of, not being sure like what are you gonna do it right back for right now or yeah like i don't know for me like i just don't even see that as a good business decision because i think that it's more likely that they lose him than it is that they save a significant amount of money yeah and and that market to your point it is expanded rapidly because one <laughs> it's a market again right it is just <laughs> direct if you check yes he's yours right but also a little bit cheaper because one year left on the contract than he would have been a year ago for clubs that were interested in him. Also a little cheaper because of the injury, right? And if you back your physios, if you back your medical room, like you will say, we can get this guy back. He's young enough. Um, he doesn't have like an extensive history of this. Injury, ACL is so a routine injury in, in 2024. Exactly. It's, 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 it's not something that's like, oh my God, who knows what he'll look like? like yeah. There's so much data. There's so much modern science. Like 
right? it's not like this dude like had a compound fracture in his shin and that right, would probably yeah. be even worse because it's like hey we don't want you to use our medical yeah. shield. it's like totally. we're gonna leave you a little bit in limp so like either way it would have yeah. sucked but like just in terms of the cold business side yeah. there there is a, a very very small uh worry right like so I, yeah. again i just don't really see the upside here but anyway just um keep... go go ahead with your center back pairing yeah, my center back pairing. I, I kind of did one of each, so to speak. I did one more for what they did on the ball and in possession and one out of possession. Um, so out of possession, John Brooks, let's just give him his flowers, right? Like, And it's been like such an open question for years now as to like his lack of run out under Greg Berhalter since he took over the U.S. Men's National Team. And obviously some of that stuff has come out. A lot of it has not yet. A lot of that is just frankly unknown still. Um, but he finally had a season where he was getting consistent playing time. He didn't move clubs like he did a year ago. Um, and <laughs> For a club that finished set or is going to fit or is currently seventh in the Bundesliga right now, he is defending in like a 92nd plus percentile across every single metric that you could hope for. Um, John Brooks has been tremendous in the air. He's uh, it, it's still kind of unclear how he'll fit, but it, it's become very clear now that he was miscast. Um, I guess more so by the 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 group before Burhalter and Burhalter in his first years as like a ball playing center back because he did come through Germany like um, he's not going to be someone who's going to be dictating the tempo out of the back or anything like that he's yeah. not going to make those sort of incisive line breaking passes with enough regularity to be that guy um, but that's where Mark McKenzie comes in because he had <laughs> quietly a phenomenal season uh, with Genk and just overall I, I think he's someone who's been completely lost in the huddle uh, as you look at the u.s men's national team center back pool uh he's had some shaky performances um but he's actually been performing very favorably the, the closest comparison that fb ref uses is taylor harwood bellis who's a player who is like high on every single per, uh premier league club's wish list FM because list. of what he's been doing with southampton right um the reality is mckenzie's been that dude in a similar level of competition over in belgium um Pass completion, progressive pass is 96th percentile of the next 14 competitions. So we're talking about uh, Europa League for one thing, but we're also talking about the championship, Major League Soccer, Liga MX, Brazil, Argentina, Portugal, Holland. These are competitions that you want to be compared against, and he is faring well. Um, you know, he's holding his own. I think it was a really good kind of prove it year for him after a really difficult 2023, 2022, uh, mm -hmm. over the last couple of years between club and country alike, left off the World Cup roster. Yeah. Um, liked a lot of what I saw from him. Yeah, so I, I thought for sure that you'd have Richards on this, and and the three, that, and it's interesting to me that like Reem and like Bro I did consider Brooks, but I thought that maybe he didn't play enough minutes, right? Like, I think it's a completely fair shout. It's just I went in a different direction, yeah. but like Tim Reem was another person I was considering, and I didn't think that he kind of surpassed either of these guys. But like, so Richards played over two thousand minutes for Crystal Palace, so that's a better team than John mm -hmm. Brooks's. Uh, than John Brooks in the, in the Bundesliga. And again, not to take anyone like that is that is still a very excellent season by him. Yeah. But I just kind of thought that Richards was going to be the the Stonewall pick for us or for, for me. Here's the thing, though. Richard spent half the year playing anywhere but center back, right? <laughs> and, and, and you forget, like, Crystal Palace had a middle season where he spent two months as a number six or a number yeah. eight, honestly. He was doing like full ball progression stuff. So he just and, and at the beginning of the season, he was at right back when he was coming yeah. in. Yeah, like, yeah it's, absolutely. That's, that's Roy Hodgson point. loved him as a right back, right? So like <laughs> there was just so much moving around that was kind of difficult to see. The other that's guy who was a really tough omission for me was Cameron Carter-Vickers, um, another guy who lost some minutes with injury. Celtic, yeah. obviously, it's kind of no man's land in Scotland where you just don't really know the quality because that team is so much better than everyone oh else God, is playing yeah. against but he's been rock solid i think that if i was going into copa america i would say my center back partnership is richards and ccv at this point but uh neither of them made my team of the year <laughs> and i good that's how it's supposed to be on merit for the season that was not uh not reputation or anything else so yeah so that's our back line right. um in the midfield i'm gonna so we both have a double pivot correct yeah. that, that's how you lay out your so all right we'll do with those two um, and this is going to sound a little bit hypocritical after talking about not playing a ton of minutes, but like Johnny Cardoso, <laughs> yeah, half well. a season at Real Batiste, like it was too good, man. Like his defensive numbers were absolutely leaked by my Liga mm -hmm. standards, like 99th percentile in interceptions, 92nd in tackles. His, um, I was surprised to see that his like ball progression numbers per 90 didn't quite stack up with yeah among La Liga midfielders. But again, I guess that it's just such a technical league and, and play styles and everything else. But like, I don't know, like how incredible defensively he was like i still don't think that there is a tyler adams replacement but like mm -hmm. johnny cardoso mm -hmm. is is at least in the conversation and i didn't think that there was going to be a conversation and that you were just going to have to completely change the way the team was set up if tyler adams was unavailable and now like some folks have said should johnny start over him if both are fit kind of thing and, and that's not yeah. an argument that i particularly align with but the right. fact that it's even 
a conversation or, or even a hint of a conversation is I think yeah. just a huge gargantuan win for him. And then uh, Weston McKinney, like in, in addition to the season in and of itself in a vacuum being an excellent season for Juventus. And, and again, sometimes you have to remind ourselves we used to be extremely excited when with Clint Dempsey at Fulham and, and when Landon Donovan <laughs> loaned to Everton right. and like, now it's like, Oh, Weston McKinney's at Juventus, whatever. Right. Like, right. so <laughs> just need to make sure to never let that be for granted for the moment. Yeah. But in addition agreed. to that, he was on the outs. He was supposed to leave this one. He was he was loaned to Leeds last year and, and had a really awful half season. So even in addition to just the performance in and of itself in a vacuum, that context, that context of being able to fight back into the team, win a place again, and become pretty irreplaceable for that team is is extraordinary. So yeah, yeah. I, I feel really, really strongly about that double pivot. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's pretty unimpeachable. The, the The interesting thing about Johnny is that he he still played a lot of minutes more than Tyler, right? So, like, I think that if you're looking purely this <laughs> summer narrow lens, it is an open question. This isn't two years ago we entered the World Cup and we knew Tyler Adams would play every minute, and the minutes he couldn't play, Kellen Acosta was the guy, right? Yeah. This isn't like a clear wow. one two hierarchy at this point. I think that it has evolved quite and, a bit. And hang on, that number two being Johnny Cardoso excelling for Real Betis. Yeah, and, and I think I've been a defender of Kellen Acosta's uh, in the past, but like I have too. This yeah. is a, oh my god, this is it's so, a different so level. Much better. And, this sounds so much better. I actually did look at Johnny a little bit for uh, our colleague Greg O'Keefe does like a weekly U.S. Men's yeah. National Team abroad uh, column, and I looked at Johnny uh, for a longer section, and it's just how he's utilized in this system. Pellegrini likes throwing him out there as more of a recirculatory guy, where the lines are broken by doing that sort of thing, where you pass it to your center back and mm-hmm. he kicks it out to one of your. Uh, you pass it to Johnny and then he kicks it out to one of your center backs to break lines and you've suddenly like created space with your movement. Mm-hmm. And so he's been doing a lot of that ball. That's not something he was doing in Brazil with Internacional. So that's also like really good to see that he's evolving and he can fit in different ways of playing the six. He isn't just that deep line playmaker sort of guy. Um, and Weston is now. <laughs> and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens right. when Massimiliano Allegri is like the one of the 50 most uh, currently under fire managers <laughs> in and Europe. also a soccer terrorist. Yeah, <laughs> so like he's the guy who's unlocked the best out of McKenney in Europe uh, since Schalke, and now um, he's going to be gone. So it'll be very interesting to see. We're probably in for another transition year for McKenney's role. Um, a couple of other guys that I had on my list. I don't know if we're doing this at the end. Maybe we're doing this. No, at you the end. do it. No, you do that. Because cool. we Thanks. talked about it with the defenders too. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I guess this kind of also ties in with my third pick, which is Gianluca Buzio, which we'll get to shortly. But mm-hmm. um, Yunus Musa, Luca De La Torre, a couple of guys, uh, especially De La Torre, I assumed was going to be in my team. I went into it as, expecting it to be him, and then he was pushed off by Buzio. Um, but both of them, consi- uh, De La Torre, consistent minutes for a lesser quality team. Musa, some more high-end minutes, um, but fewer of them. Uh, mm-hmm. good, good first year for Milan. I think he gave himself a lot that he can build off of. Um but yeah, for me, there's there's just no one who can really come close to uh, Johnny and McKenney. Yeah, Tessman, that was a difficult one to yeah. cut. And then it was if if I wanted to tweak that, like I probably would have had to cut Tillman if I was going to put a, another central midfielder in there. Hardest um, mission on my team. Yeah. Yeah. So te- <laughs> Tessman, and so it's interesting that like so I lean Tessman slightly ahead of Busio for how their season went. So this will be a nice easy transition for you to talk about how great yeah. I think both have been excellent, mm-hmm. but for me, my slight lean was Tessman. So why was your lean Busio? I, I think that this was so another criteria that I kind of looked at is like compared to past seasons. And I think that since leaving Kansas City, Busio has just kind of really struggled to find what his role is with Venezia. Yeah. And part of that is the club getting relegated in his first season there, right? And so like there's just the the, the general, oh, all of my teammates have left me. <laughs> all of my high end teammates are gone. Now who am I working with? And you're rebuilding all those connections, right? Except for Tessman. Um, but I think with Busio, this was this was a year where you saw the attacking midfield side of him really come out. So yeah. I think what seven goals for assists and Sarah B. So like really good output there. I think his line breaking has never been better. I think that he's just more consistent ultimately. So I'm comparing that to past precedent. I think Tessman has just been rock solid. He's been a, a really, really steady midfielder. Um, when given the opportunity, I think the two of them, if they're given the opportunity to be part of the starting midfield at the Olympics, I think that that's going to be a great engine room for the U.S. to build off of. Um, but I just personally preferred the flair. And honestly, when I looked at my team and I was trying to build this for like an actual, how would this team do on the field? Yeah. If I have Tessman, McKenney, and Johnny <laughs> as like a three man kind of base midfield, like that, that is just the slowest, most plotting thing ever. So I needed John Luca to liven it up a little bit. I, I really could have gone with Malik Tillman as well. But um, yeah, you had you had Tillman in the uh, attacking midfield role as well, right? Yeah, so I, I went with like as the four four two 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 whatever. A lot of flexibility kind of from those yeah. two attacking midfielders, and so yeah, Tillman and Kristen Pulisic. 
Um, so Tillman, again, in terms of like minutes played or whatever, again, it was only 1,500 Eredivisie minutes, but he had 18 goal contributions in that time. And like, look, I understand yeah. that he's playing in a juggernaut. The team was unreal. They put up incredible numbers across the board. The goal difference was just gross. It was just insane. <laughs> and so you're going to get a little bit more juice, but like nine goals and 11 assists, that that's that was just too much for me to look off of. And yeah, again, I know PSV walked the league. I know that they were dominating game states, everything else all the time. So he was, yeah. in addition to his attacking output, he was, his kind of defensive metrics in pressing were really strong too, like 90% um, among wingers in, in tackles as well. 99% percentile on assists, 94th and non-penalty uh, mm. uh, goals. Like it's just everywhere you look is elite. And again, I, this would have been a much more difficult conversation if a couple other like wide or attacking midfield based players. Some yeah. Particularly Gio Reyna like played more, played better. Well, you season. got Brendan Aronson looking over your shoulder too, right? <laughs> the, and with a lead scarf. So it's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, so again, that, that was not somebody who was under consideration nope. this year, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. But yeah, just, I, I kept on going back and forth, uh, back around with like Tillman is like, there's yeah. no real way that I'm going to leave him off. So that's where it was for me. And then obviously Pulisic, I'll say it's now, this was my player of the season for Americans abroad in Europe. Yeah, twelve goals and seven assists and about twenty five hundred Serie A minutes. I believe they have two games left. One game, they they he could still slightly add to that. Um, yeah. and his his metrics were all elite in terms of underlying numbers in Serie A, like eighty third percent silent non penalty expected goals, expected assists, progressive carries, progressive passes received, like everything that you possibly wanted from him in terms of box score numbers, underlying performances, eye test, and possibly most important, just consistent playing time, both in yeah. terms of the coach trusting him and his body holding up. So I. I yeah. couldn't imagine the season going better for Christian Pulisic in a realistic way that we were all thinking about this time last year. Where is he going to go? Oh, Syria Sir- might make sense. Maybe Napoli, maybe. Oh, AC Milan, that's perfect. I think that's going to be a good fit. And even with those expectations of assuming that this was going to go well, like I think that he exceeded those. I think he did too. Uh, and I had him at my right wing, obviously. Yeah. Um, Tillman was just kind of a formation casualty once yeah. I decided to go 4 3 3, which also just mirrors what Berhalter likes to do True. most often. So um, it felt like the easiest to choose that. But with Polisic, I think that, that it was proof of belief for a lot of his backers, not just US men's national team fans, right. but also people who just looked at him at Dortmund and said, that's him, right? And he could have had the career that people also thought that Jaden Sancho could have had, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you make one wrong move to the one wrong club, and both of them found out that you, you know, you're, you're shunted into different roles. You're more of a rotation figure, whatever. Um, and then when Milan signed Chukwueze as well this past summer, I think everyone looked and said, "Okay, I was right, a little bit he's, worried. <laughs> he's going to be in an open competition. Oh, here we go again, right?" But um, he held his own, not just in the role against like a, a worthy, you know, competitor for minutes in that right wing space. Uh, but he also held his own with Rafael Leao and Olivier Giroud um, on that front line. All three of them have very similar goal contributions. All three of them mm. had similar interplay touches and final third, all that sort of thing. It's not like he was the third guy on a forward line with two players who are universally respected as like great attackers in Europe. Mm-hmm. So um, I think it was a really formational year for Pulisic. Uh, I think it was the year he needed. I don't think he could have really afforded to have another season of just kind of middling in and out of the line of mm-hmm. performances. So that was huge for him. Um, and and overall, I think Milan is the perfect club for him to be at. Um, it, it's a good fit for the minutes. It's a good fit for the role. It's also just a good fit for vibes because we also got to see him <laughs> get into spots in that right half space where he can just tee up a shot rather than trying to think too much on the left like he yeah. was with Chelsea and just get some of those like classic like you remember it was like a trend again six eight years ago the dark times of u.s men's national team <laughs> twitter where it was just like Polisic is on the field and everyone like every reporter that a fan is following is tweeting in unison that was my is favorite joke <laughs> in the 75th minute of a game right like <laughs> we are way past that now with him with the program as a whole but yeah i'm with you that's the player of the season overall no matter what yeah, that was that was always funny when you just see just like Pulisic, like the same tweet, and then yeah, I would wait three minutes and go like, "Hey, does anybody know if Christian Pulisic is playing?" <laughs> that was inevitable I with it. a screenshot of like any five <laughs> people who are in this space. It was just like all of you did it. I just picked. <laughs> um, and then I know that we have the same two players, but in yeah. a slightly different way. It doesn't really matter. Haji Wright, Coventry City, Josh Sargent, North City. Both yeah. of these players were tied for six in the Golden Booth race in the Champo with sixteen goals. Uh, Josh Sargent had the second best goals per 90 minute uh, ratio 
behind mm-hmm. Jamie Vardy in the like top 25 scores in the championship. And I didn't continue looking past Pretty that. Soon. So it could be yeah. further, but just didn't want to get caught on being well. Actually, somebody had one, uh, one right, right, uh, 30 right. minute appearance that scored one goal and he's ahead of him. So um, <laughs> 16 goals and two assists in 1800 minutes. It's a goal yeah. contribution every hundred minutes. It's really elite. Um, but again, I love using the per 90 stuff here. And then I know I did it for Tillman as well, but like yep. a team of the season, you have to have the cumulative numbers as well. And he did have, uh, he did have both Jeff Sargent. That is. Yeah. And with Haji, right. The last three years playing for three different clubs in, in England and Turkey before this mm-hmm. 16 goals this year, 15 the year before 14 year before that. So that's really impressive that he's been adaptable like this. And yeah. like he got off to a slower start with Coventry. Like he really came on at the end of the season. He was absolutely oh, yeah. awesome. Um, I do hope to see some consistency for him in terms of staying at Coventry City, but I would firmly understand why he would want to leave and capitalize on this moment to maybe have more opportunities open for him and why Coventry might say his value ain't going any higher than like there there might be too many offers to refuse. But for me, like just for a player who's had so much instability in his career and changing club after club after club, I think it'd be cool to see him stay at Coventry. But again, um, I understand a pay raise talks talks pretty loudly (laughs) and, and again, yeah. the opportunity to climb the, the club ladder. So I, w- I wouldn't really blame him, but maybe one more year at the championship. Yeah, I, I think another year ne- wouldn't necessarily hurt. And and that FA Cup run certainly did a lot oh, to yeah. kind of remind people what Haji Wright can do. Um, it's also just really interesting with this specific duo because one moved from being forced onto the wing because Tamo Puki was like, <laughs> you know, Mr. Norwich for so yeah. long. And then he finally gets to play in his role. And it's like, oh, yeah, he was actually that guy all along. He was yeah. just waiting for his chance. So, like, really good kind of prove it year again for Josh Sargent. Um, I mean, there are a few other strikers who are playing regularly uh, in pretty high-level leagues, like, you know, Jordan Pifak, Ricardo Pepe, yep. a little less regularly, of course. And then Flair and Balogun, of course, had probably the most frustrating year of any player in the pool uh, with Monaco compared to, you know, when, when comparing his goal output to the chances yeah. that were created for him by his teammates, right? Um, and then Haji Wright, you know, always viewed because of his size as like, this is your target forward, right? They push him <laughs> off on the wing and all Proper of a sudden mate. it's just like... Right. That was when it happened, right? When Coventry finally like shunted him wide and put someone else in that striker, he really flourished playing off of a, a strike partner. So that's possibly rel- revelatory heading into the Copa America. Yes. Like, do you put him on the left? Um, especially now with Sergio Dest out, right? Like, do you move Tim Weah to right back? Do you move Christian Pulisic to his right side that he's been playing with Milan? And then do you put Haji right on the left? Do you put Gio Reyna on the left, right? Like it opens a lot of permutations now because of the success that he had this season. So um, really, really, really good year for Haji, right? Yeah, and, and like, again, the, 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 his skill set is like this, but he's always going to be a little bit of a prisoner. Like if, if you're just casually looking at him, like you said, it's like, oh, that looks like a proper target forward. But like, the underlying numbers is Josh Sargent was more of the like yes, he physical <laughs> poacher, not involved in the buildup and the link up. Like all the underlying numbers, for, it's like yeah. Haji Wright is the one that's that's combining and and uh, getting the ball at feet and dribbling and stuff like that. As opposed to again, if you just stood them next to each other, you'd be like, oh, that's the target man, that's the right. second forward. So and, like it, like I think that that's something that he's probably like it, it's just the nature of, of soccer writer, the nature of fandom, or even scouts. Like when you first look yeah. at him, that you like that's kind of the first thought, and you have to kind yeah. of challenge your own like perceptions and everything. totally yeah. and to be fair too he played in turkey like that's a league that still <laughs> loves route one so like part of this is also just game state and style right like yeah. even if he wasn't very good at it he had a lot of chances to do it <laughs> when he was at Antalya Spor. but um yeah way way better off in this sort of role and uh, honestly i think just exciting to see him maybe get more of a run out um new york cosmos legend by the way Taji, right <laughs> I'm repping the NASL hard today. I've got the San Francisco was, Deltas jersey on. And I was going to ask right. what that was. <laughs> San Francisco Deltas, best team in American soccer history. One season, one title. <laughs> very, very good hit rate. Um, <laughs> with, uh, uh, sliding doors one for Haji, right? So the when he was leaving Turkey, or I, I, can, I forget if it was his first Turkish club or, or, or this past yeah. season, to be fair. The club was in worrying about debts and worrying about FIFA fair play and that like they were going to need to move players and Haji yeah. right I kept on being told and there was intermediaries like his name came up for the Chicago fire and it was like I don't believe that anything got actually serious but like there was at least people within the game who were trying to make that I thought it was possible enough and like interesting thank god <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fires. it's kind of all lead that one at that would have been uh just ask Casper Shubilko how that would have worked out for him um dude no, it, well, well Kazu Shabilko got a, a larger contract than anybody else would have given him so he's doing all right yeah. now he's at, at FC Lugano in the beautiful Swiss Alps all like 
Good for him. Like, he's doing great. He, he's, he served his time. They moved him to a sibling club, right? And now he's uh, he's in paradise. That's the dream, honestly. That's why everyone comes to Major League Soccer, right? So you can play in the Alps. Um, so, yeah, we've talked about kind of our toughest omissions. Yeah. Obviously, Tessman for me, Busio as well. Uh, Brandon Vasquez, Alexander Dejas. Like, I, don't, I didn't, like, really consider either one of them, particularly given the players ahead of them. But, like... I think that they had good seasons. Um, yeah. And I know Vasquez is only half season outside of MLS. And then Tim Ream Fulham obviously always has to be. And Luca Colioso, yeah, what could have been maybe for him if he didn't get hurt mm-hmm. early. Like, what? And I, I broke the news that signing to Burnley and like it flopped in terms of like people weren't super interested. And yeah. like, and I didn't blame him because this was a, a young kid, an interesting prospect, interesting talent. You never knew exactly, like, would he go Conrad De La Fuente or would he go in a more positive direction? <laughs> And he was awesome, man. In and a it was... more positive direction. Than... <laughs> Anything but rock On bottom. scale from Conrad De La Fuente <laughs> to something good. But, like, it just goes to show how quickly, too, that, like, so whatever, by October or whenever yeah. he did his injury, like, it was like, oh, my God, like, headlines, if if, if he's in the starting lineup, uh, like, everybody's yeah. kind of more paying attention when he's really on the radar. So um, hopefully that he'll be back and, and ready to go next year. But um, this is terms deep. of his form. Like the number of guys that we rattled off is like we could have viably chosen him and backed our pick. Like mm-hmm. we've said it twice now, but like it is a really good spot to be. Um, it's also why I don't buy into the whole this is our golden generation hype because I think that this is just kind of the reality of where American yeah. player development is these days. Um, and I think that this is sustainable when you look at, I mean, obviously you've been. Uh, way on the the Kevin Sullivan uh, reporting beat lately, and so you've been you've now been at the U15 ranks um, to to see uh, the quality that's coming up. But like it's just it's 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 good to see. It's encouraging. It doesn't feel like it's hinging on again Dempsey at Fulham. That's our that's our hope. That's our shot. So um, really strong year overall. I would say it was it was a good year, not necessarily as expected for certain players, yeah. um, but good year overall. I'll, I'm going to leave a nugget in here for any of the legends that are, are still listening to us ramble at this point. Um, with the Kevin Sullivan stuff, I have a close source that I, I like a lot. He does this in, in good jest and good fun, like or, or sending a text. Hey, if the FBI is reading this, I do not condone of, of your tweets. <laughs> but you just, just want to put that in. My so that's been good fun. Good banter. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's tough. That is a tough part of the beat. You've heard about that in our group chats too, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, a couple quick hitting questions. We we yeah. already said best best performer Pulisic. Who's your biggest pleasant surprise? Pleasant surprise. I guess it's Johnny getting a move to Europe, right? Because like it just it, the Brazilian league is in such a weird spot now, where Good clubs point. are desperate to sell players before <laughs> they show up for the first team. Right? It's kind of rare for a player um, of any national na- nationality to have like three good years in the Brazilian Serie A and then um push forward and go abroad certainly if you're not brazilian so like i think that was a pleasant surprise um i would say josh Sargent being a sis- consistent goal scorer was another very pleasant surprise for me as i look at my team um because again he's just been playing so many different roles for norwich norwich has been yeah. a club that is constantly trying to figure out its attack and i think they, they finally figured out their best attack has josh Sargent starting at striker <laughs> and that is a big step forward for him that's career. a good point that's a good point. Uh, so I had Johnny down or Haji Wright just because of the explosion and yeah. some of those like big top moments. And particularly, like you said, with the FA Cup run, that, that really helped with rather than it being a Tuesday championship game, like like hitting Great. some of those moments were, were really, really cool. And, and the late goals and stuff. So that'll do him a lot of favors. But what an excellent season for him. Yeah. Uh, biggest disappointment. I think this one's easy for me. It's Gio Reyna, like from start yeah. to finish, both with Dortmund and then yeah. um, the unfortunate career advice to go to Nottingham Forest instead of a mid table Italian or Spanish team where there was, you know, I don't know. I think you and I could have consulted that one for a tenth of the fee <laughs> to say, I think it's much more likely that you're going to get playing time um, elsewhere. Yeah. Maybe a don't fight. Maybe if you want to be an attacking midfielder, don't go to a club that doesn't play with an attacking midfielder. <laughs> like that's, that's number one, right? I think number yeah, two is like also just one. don't go for a club that has just bought EAFC for the first time and is transferring its entire roster. Every single window like <laughs> Nottingham Forest has been for two years running now. Like it's just, it's not stable. It's not a good framework. It's it, Matt Turner. They have brought in, I think in three consecutive windows, four different goalkeepers who start for their national teams. Costa Rica, United States, Belgium, Greece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's an incredible way to frame. That that's a perfect way to frame it. Too. Why would you go there right now if you're a player? But like uh, other disappointments. If I'm just trying to like think beyond those that group, I think 
it's it's just kind of a sad reality with with Tim Ream, who didn't get a, enough of a chance with the U.S. Men's National Team when he was at his peak. His Agreed. pain for such a long level. Luckily, it overlapped with the 2022 World Cup, so he did get that big sort of tournament. But yeah. I think going into the year, we all kind of assumed that was the one center back who would be good through Copa, and then we need to start thinking of like succession plans. I think that just the the, the nature of the beast that process has sped up a little bit. He fell out of the lineup by mid season with Fulham. Um, and uh, yeah, I think just overall, it's just a matter of, okay, what comes next for him? So. Yeah. What comes next in terms of the summer? I do hope to see Cameron Carter Vickers get a move to the premier league. I know that that's kind of been what uh, it's been at least reported that that's what he's eyeing. I hope that that does indeed happen. I'd like Reynolds, Brian Reynolds to move up as well. I know that this would be changing clubs technically two years in a row, but he was on loan at Westerloo before making the permanent move to Westerloo. And I can tell you from sourcing the entire plan wasn't for this. It's like Westerloo wasn't like, we're going to have you for eight years. Thank God you're here. Like right. Westerloo is like, we want to help move you on. And, and look, yeah. we were a good, we're good home for you last year. So you can trust us that you're going to one play. It's a good system for you, all that stuff. So like, this was an all parties decision that he's not going to be here for all that long. And yeah. the way that they structured the payment plan, I don't know if they have the money for him to be there for that long because <laughs> the transfer fees are going to start coming up. I don't, I don't know what their That's finances true. are right now. But it's part of the, the reason why the deal is such a good deal is because of the payment plan and that it's like, we think that we're going to sell him before we have to pay the whole transfer fee anyway. So like it's pretty funny. <laughs> so um, I think that there's going to be a market for him this summer. I'm, I'm curious to see what happens there. And yeah. then I know we already talked about Anthony Robinson and, and like I'm open to it. But like if he's at full next year, I'd still be extremely yeah. happy. It's also probably about time we think about Mark McKenzie getting a move too. He's been there yes, in Belgium. Good shout. Good and it's shout. a league that's like solid, you know, the, the play, Belgium has that weird like promotion and relic or like not promotion, but like that championship playoff structure. <laughs> and that club makes it every year, but they finish kind of bottom of that heap every yes. single year. So it's like, okay, let's try to get you to a club that's challenging for Europe in any sort of way, or let's get you into a big five league where you're playing against a higher caliber. Kind of a, a similar problem yeah. actually to Cameron Carter Vickers, right? To a different scale where it's just, we want to have, defenders playing against high level attackers as often as they can be. So um, that would be another one that I'm looking at. Uh, Obviously Johnny Cardoso suddenly has a lot of doors that could be open to him. I don't know if it's the right time. I think that when you, I don't think it is. (laughs) And and when you look at some of the clubs that are in for him, man, like it's like Barcelona, do you want to go to Barcelona now? Like, don't get me wrong. I grew up a Barcelona kid. Right. But like, I wouldn't, (laughs) but, or is it also the, the famed interest? That's, Right. I think that's kind of all I would say is air quote interest on it. Like that makes sense. There's not a lot that I've heard on this front. Um, it wouldn't surprise me yeah. if teams are watching them, but like your Betis, only, you'd have to be blown away by an offer, right? Yeah. Like, so I don't, you I don't pretty think much have to say sense. double it. Here's what we paid, <laughs> triple it. It's yeah. it to be even worth our time to listen to it. And honestly, for how little they probably paid to get him, it's probably even more than that. So yeah. I think he's in a really good spot to stay for another year. Um, we'll see what happens with Weston, man, and Geo, like another. Two guys oh my God. Are kind of <laughs> flux, flux. Yeah, yeah that Gio. that should have that should have led that that part. I don't like I don't know. We I feel like we've been just doing uh geo transfer watch. That's a standalone, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um all right, Jeff. I'm gonna let you go. I appreciate you uh being the debut guest on the program. You need to uh you all need to read Jeff if you're not already. I'm I'm personally very upset if with you if you don't read Jeff Reuters excellent writing and tweeting and everything else. So Jeff, thank you for coming on. Of course. Thanks for having me and keep up the good work, man. This channel has been absolute fire. I don't know where you find the time to do this or the energy, <laughs> but I'm glad you do because it makes for some really, really good listening and watching. So keep it up, man. I need more energy to be better at editing. I think that's just intellectual, <laughs> not uh, not energy. But anyway, yeah. appreciate it.